Hello. Uh, oh, that's quite right. Uh, sorry, one sec. So it's gone significantly wrong. I didn't. I don't know even if it was a sensible question. Okay, that's. Enjoy presenting my presentation. Uh, ah, there we go. I can see what I'm meant to see now. Uh, hi, my name is Simon Falbon. I'm a software engineer at BBC News. I've been there for a couple of years now. Um, and I've kind of been working on lots of things around BBC around AWS and how we're moving there from a central infrastructure around in our own data centers. Um, we've not really thought too much about how we're moving there before we actually moved. So we're still building all the tools and services. I want to share some of the ways we're going to do it um, and how we're using Docker. So obviously we use a CI system of some sort. Uh, the BBC is pretty embedded with Jenkins. Um, and so we built a system around how to use Docker with it. Um, we also built some other little bits of tools and tried setting up a platform as a service. Uh, a little bit of background for people that haven't been at the BBC before. Uh, obviously, we have a whole ton of software, uh, servers in two data centers, um, and everything is in a shared resource. So all your RPMs across however many pl um, pl projects we have, so iPlayer, news, sport, radio, and such, all gets installed on each of these 100 PHP servers. And then we have another 40 or so for JVM and another few for data storage of some sort. Um, those are mirrored and it's kind of okay, it's a bit ropey. So when we do a release, we do it every two weeks onto live. Sometimes it goes really horribly wrong and things go comically wrong. Uh, so in the last year, like I said, we've started to deploy and using AWS for push button, push button deployments, um, which is really great for us developers because we're now the ones completely in control of everything. And the BBC has entered this brave new world without some of the tools, like monitoring, logging, and such. Um, so we started building. And we recently started investing a lot of time within building a CI server that's not centrally provisioned and horrible. And so we started using Jenkins and Docker. Uh, we're using Jenkins purely because that's how the BBC's always done it, either between Jenkins or Hudson. So we kept with something that people are used to in our teams. Uh, and so traditionally, we've used a centrally provisioned version of Hudson, which has, I did a count this morning, 4,568 jobs on, that's just for the PHP apps. That's not going into all of our JVM style stuff. So it's quite depressing. And, <laughs> and it's static. You, if you want a new version of Ruby, that's not happening. Uh, so we're not the first people to do this. Not by a long shot. Lots of people have done different versions of setting up Docker with Jenkins or Jenkins inside of Docker or whatever variation of that. Um, we've gone through some of the use cases that people have put forward but decided they weren't quite right for us. Um, and we didn't really want something as complex as eBay's system where it's Docker inside of Docker on Apache Mesos. Although pretty awesome, maybe in the future when we have time. Uh, so we've built a pretty scalable and simple infrastructure of have one Jenkins master which is deployed directly onto an instance on AWS and then use a practically unlimited number of slaves, which kind of works. And we have a Docker registry to put all of our build images up. And since we're hosting all of this, we get the flexibility that comes with all of this. And obviously our slaves use auto-scaling groups. Our slaves are able to scale based on whatever metric we define. So if we decide that we need more instances based around CPU usage, we spin up another and then another for RAM. And if we have long running jobs, then another instance and isolate it just for that job. Out of the box, Jenkins supports build slaves, but it 
they don't auto register, which sucks. Um, which is a bit of a problem since we don't know how many slaves we're going to have. We don't know the names or any details about them. They just going to exist at some point. Ultimately, we got around this by using the Swarm plugin. Sorry, I couldn't find a good Swarm GIF. <laughs> but it does auto register, which is a lot better. Um, BBC News has a lot of people doing a lot of things. It's not just PHP anymore. It's not just a JVM based language. We've got different things running all the time. And there's a lot of environments to maintain. So this is where Docker comes in, where instead of the traditional way that I guess you guys are perhaps expecting of running everything inside of a container, including Jenkins and Jenkins agents, we're letting the jobs just call directly out to Docker. Um, because using a container to run out jobs inside of, it's a lot simpler. And I don't really want to be the guy maintaining Jenkins forever. Uh, so now we can have that big hooray and go team, um, where teams are responsible for their own infrastructure and their own build environments. So we've got a workflow of traditional Docker one of build, push, let the slave pull it, and then run it until it terminates, uh, which have some issues for us to work around, the container updates. What do we do when the development team has their own uh, uh, their own build environment, and they update it, push it? The slave is stuck on the old version, so we have to force people to clean up after themselves, use cron and wipe it off every hour or so if a job isn't running, which it can't do, and gets rejected if the image is actually in use or hope our machine scales down and we just don't deal with it, which is sucky. Uh, we have another issue with build artifacts in the very specific way that the BBC does uh, packaging of RPMs. We have to run every container on Jenkins in privileged mode if we're building, a cont uh, building an RPM, which isn't ideal. This is due to the fact we're using Red Hat's mock project. I don't know if you guys know it or not. Um, which essentially uses named, uh, namespace processes within a ch root, which is kind of like Docker and Docker, but without Docker. Uh, so we're not far from it. Um, and we also have our own build chain, which is unique to the BBC, which is a load of Python scripts that we built as command line tools. Um, so each build environment has to inherit from this, or we create an overlay which is something we haven't solved yet. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's 100 times better from where we were this time a month ago, where we now have customized environments, and we can handle a lot of load. And we manage everything. Uh, we have another part of our Docker strategy, which is, sorry, this is a GitHub link. Please go check it out. A contractor for BBC News built this tool called Spurious. Uh, he's sitting in the back there, somewhere near the camera. Uh, so what is it? It allows developers who are using AWS to develop completely locally. You don't have to use AWS resources to use AWS resources, meaning that beyond initial setup and pulling down of images, the development can happen all offline, and we're faking a lot of the AWS services. Um, and so we've got the ability to fake queues, we've got the ability to fake DynamoDB, S3, and Elastic Cache, uh, which has its issues of what do we do with that state, but we don't really care. It's not production, it's not leaving the machine. So trash it, and if we care, we can use volumes. Users for this are been quite successful in a couple of projects we've used for the BBC. We used it in the elections coverage, which you may have seen a few months ago for the local and European elections, and you'll see it again next week for the Scottish referendum. Um, and we also use it for another project called Kaleidoscope, which is an image-based website for BBC News. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what Kaleidoscope is, other than 
just an image-based website, which is every website. Uh, so an image-based website to us is a screenshot of a BBC News website in a specific language, which we then break into small clickable parts representing a story block or little fragments to make it easier to download for the user. Uh, the BBC has this remit of we have to supply news in 28 different languages, <coughs> sorry, 28 different languages, and we do this image-based thing because some of these devices that people are using in, say, for Arabic languages can't display the required font. And so we have to take screenshots and display that. And there's 10 editions that we have to do this for. So we can take a seemingly simple architecture and replace the AWS specific components. So in this case, we're replacing SQS DynamoDB and S3 because we don't want to spin up all of these resources 10 times for different developers. And so now we're saving license fee payers a bit of money by not running this. Um, we also have a platform as a service, which is a bit weird because we're running two. Um, we jumped on the idea of this because we have a typical sandbox development and it would have been a good idea to move that as a, from a virtual machine and host it multiple times within our cluster. And so this came about from, we jumped on this, we saw Docker come up repeatedly on stuff like Hacker News and became fairly popular as we all know because we're all here. And it's, we could just replace our crusty one use virtual machines with hundreds of containers. Um, and it helps us defeat the problems we have with our centrally provisioned infrastructure of we can't do certain things that we would like to do. For instance, we want to be able to test and preview things we're working on and not wait until the very last moment for an error. <laughs> Sorry, I can't find the spoof version of this on YouTube. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, the BBC test card uh, from the 1980s or so. Uh, so our usual workflow is build, merge, unit tests, install that to integration, and run some more Cucumber tests. There's a problem with that because we have to merge and have everything in our master branch in order to test it correctly on the environment, um, which is a huge problem for us because we want to be able to see failure quickly. And when you have 50 developers pushing every day, it becomes a massive, massive problem. Uh, so with all of our developers running flat out, we're probably using four to five branches at any given point, um, with a queue of about 75 things waiting as an experiment or some sort of feature to be checked by a stakeholder. And so we decided that we should find a way of sharing this with people. We want to be able to show our product manager or whatever this new feature that we've just added as they've required it. And so we came with the idea of running a platform as a service. We have two options. We can build something, which seems lovely, or we could just install an open source one, which everyone could do. I mean, there's quite a few. So we did both. I wanted to build it. I mean, I'm a developer. It's silly, but <laughs> um, so we started creating a platform as a service system. Um, I came up with at least five different architectures. Turns out that building one of these things is quite hard. So if you've done it, well done. Uh, eventually, I settled on creating a very thin layer around Fleet's HTTP experimental API. If you've seen it at all which changes every week or two at the moment. So we submit a basic fleet file, a uh, unit file, sorry, and does all the heavy lifting of cloning, building, or pulling, and then running it. And then it uses a HA proxy, reverse proxy, and we have a nice subdomain to get to our function, our feature, sorry. Um, 
But there's a lot of ways you can build a Docker container and run one. And how do you manage all the different variances? Because whilst we want, we have this idea for our sandbox, we know exactly what's going to happen and what things we need to do. It'd be nice to make it very generic for development services. So if we want to run um, dashboards and such and containers, which we are doing on different ways. Um, we don't want to do that. We just want to run make build or make run or fig up and fig destroy or whatever. Uh, so we'd move the complexity elsewhere. Um, we also investigated using open source tools. So we've got Flynn, Deus, and Doku. Um, and we evaluated these quite quickly as they popped up one by one um, and checking out their individual use case. Uh, Doku and Flynn are really cool, but they're limited to Heroku build packs, and no one wants to maintain build packs because you don't want to do that every time you have a new service. So that left Deus. Deus is actually really cool. It does a lot of the functionality you want. You can build from a Docker file, and to deploy, you just do a quick git push. The downside is that there's no real support for running the same thing multiple times with slight variances. So if you want to run 20 different branches, you can't do that without removing the app markers locally, so removing the Git remote and whatever else it leaves behind. So you, it's a bit of a limitation. And Dees kind of likes running your stuff with its stuff. So it runs a logging container and it runs a controller and whatever else. And sometimes if you're app container takes a while to start, it will fall down and you have to restart everything. And your application doesn't get registered in the reverse proxy, which has probably been fixed since writing these slides. Um, so where's all this going? I'm pretty sure you're asking. Uh, well, BBC News now has these two clusters running Docker containers, one for the tool we've made and one using Deus. Both are capable of running and showing branches uh, but they're about equally performant, about as stable as each other. Um, despite the limitations of Deus, uh, my tool is not perfect either, but okay. We obviously want to limit this down to one, maybe move to something completely different like Helios by Spotify. That looks pretty useful. Um, and then hopefully get to a point where other people in BBC News can use this. So. It's not just developers, and it's not just me, it's stakeholders. Or maybe we can have it so we push from, when we push to GitHub, it automatically picks up the webhook, and we just extend our tool sets. Uh, so that's actually the end of my slides. Um, does anyone have any relevant questions? <laughs> hey. Hey. Uh, from AWS. Hello. Hey. Um, I was just wondering how you're actually faking the AWS services. Like, uh, I imagine, like, Elasticache is just a local Redis, uh, uh, but some of the others. for us is a local memcache. Okay. Because that's what we used to in the BBC. Uh, but there's quite a few gems out there, or, I mean, Amazon themselves provide the fake DynamoDB. Yeah. And there's a lot of Ruby gems to fake S3 and SQS. And there's also a Java project for SQS which we tried running for a little while. OK, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, oh. OK, um, how do you uh, provide this Jenkins instances to your teams? Like Sorry? You said you're having this Jenkins infrastructure, yep. and teams can um, provision their Jenkins infrastructure themselves. Yep. Um, are you using your one of the two pass solutions you have in house uh, or we're not houses? we're essentially running everything on bare virtual machines on AWS for instances uh, the development teams themselves get to write their docker file inside and just leave a docker file inside their repo um, and we can either build that for them or they can build it and push it to the registry uh, so it's not so much a case of we have to provision a different Jenkins system for everyone it's a case of our Jenkins system between BBC News, which we're no longer sharing with Sport, iPlayer, and whoever else. Um, we've got one just for BBC News, and 
the Docker container should be enough for each individual development team within News. So they provision the slave as a Docker? Uh, or? Yeah, it's more of provisioning what they want inside of their container. Uh -huh. uh, anyone else? Next. Yay. You're getting off easy. I think we... No, I'm way ahead of schedule. Okay. Thank Five, you. Two minutes. <laughs>